Thank you very much for coming to this library lecture series lecture by Jim Chappell, who's coming from San Francisco and primarily is representing uh, the work of SPUR, S-P-U-R, the San Francisco Planning and Urban Research Unit. So Jim is an architect and planner and has spent most of his life working with this organization which has a focus on advocacy and of developing cities through the process of engagement of groups that uh, relate to each other, be it the stakeholders, owners, um, builders, developers, professionals, as well as the administration. So understanding new models of how actually a city may develop and who makes choices in terms of the development and growth of a city. So he's come uh, to do a number of things here. There was a tremendous engagement over the weekend in Atma where three cities were discussed, which was um, representing Copenhagen, San Francisco, and Ahmedabad, and seeing how different cities develop different models and have different priorities about how uh, development takes place. So he's going to present uh, his understanding of his own model to see about engaging a conversation around where we're going in Ahmedabad. And the, the, the timing is wonderful here in terms of the rate of transformation that Ahmedabad is undergoing. And obviously many of you are involved in planning studies as well as architecture studies. So the opportunity to connect, engage, discuss, he's here for that. So please welcome Mr. Jim Chappell. Uh, thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, tell me who you are. How, how many people here are architects or architecture students? Okay. And um, urban planning, city planning, urban design students? Okay. And what else do we have? Okay. Okay. So, as Arthur said, um, I represent San Francisco Planning and Urban Research Association, a uh, now 110-year-old good urban planning, uh, good uh, city management organization. And we are a volunteer organization, uh, an organization that consists of architects, planners, um, good government types, city attorneys, developers, all working on a volunteer basis to make things happen. And as we look at your wonderful campus and, and uh, this wonderful building, we know Doshi had some very specific ideas and he got them done here. And we look at uh, what Lou Kahn has done here, what Le Corbusier has done, all different architects with very different ideas, but an ability the one ability they have in the same was to get them done. And there are many good designers in the world, and I'm sure and hopeful that many of you in this room will f fit in that category. But the question is, how do you get things built? And you need a good client, you, but you also need a community that is accepting and desirous of good architecture. Uh, you need government regulation and uh, government leaders and bureaucrats who will help your projects get through. And so what, and also on the other hand, will help stop projects that should not happen. And there, there are both kinds of those in this world. Hopefully you will be uh, leading with the former more than the latter. And so SPUR works in a uh, number of different areas to try and make the right thing happen. And we do it from the bottom up, from citizens, from individual architects, planners, uh, developers, and just ordinary citizens. And um, well, it looks like we have a number of number one priorities on this. This slide rendered a little funny, but there are eight different areas uh, we work in. You know, we work in community planning, which is the overall overarching idea. And, you know, we want to 
help build great neighborhoods. Transportation, a huge problem uh, here in Ahmedabad and a huge problem around the world. You know, we need to find better ways to get people where they need to go. City dwellers around the world have a lot to learn from one another. And the forces are the same in economically successful cities like Ahmedabad and San Francisco in that there is a tremendous immigration because these are places where the economy is developing and jobs are developing. And they are places that provide many opportunities for us as architects. But um, we're finding that our cities are needing to be bigger than we ever thought they were going to be. And this has brought in a crisis of infrastructure, a crisis of transportation, of water, of, of sewer, of solid waste disposal, of, of many other things. Um, housing, you know, how do we provide enough housing to make it affordable for people to live? Economic development, how do we keep the economic engine running and providing the right kinds of jobs? Uh, regional planning, um, I know Ahmedabad has uh, uh, more than once expanded its, it, it, its boundaries because uh, no man is an island and no city is an island. Uh, sustainable development, uh, we are in uh, growing crises around the world about our impact on the environment. Disaster planning, uh, another thing our two cities share is uh, uh, earthquakes and, um, and then finally, uh, supporting local government, which may sound like a funny thing for architects to do, but we're all dependent in some uh, way or fashion on uh, planning departments and public works departments and uh, getting uh, what we need to uh, create great buildings and to create great cities. Let me see if I can figure this out. And um, you, you are all digital natives. Uh, I'm a digital uh, immigrant, and uh, I'm, I'm very dependent on you. So without talking any more about SPUR, I thought it would be good to just talk about some of the projects we have done and some of the things we have been able to uh, accomplish. And um, uh, we will look at uh, two or three uh, case studies here and hopefully demonstrate how this working from the bottom up of citizens um, has made the city better and uh, has resulted in uh, better neighborhoods and urban design and architecture. And Yerba Buena Center is an example of pivoting the city to a post-industrial economy. And this project started 50 years ago when San Francisco was in danger of turning into uh, a rust belt city as industry and the port fled the city for other places. And there was a large neighborhood in the inner city that was filled with substandard slums, essentially. And at the same time, the city needed some new things to help pivot from the old industrial economy to a new um, uh, office and service economy, including a uh, convention center and a first class office space. And so this is that same neighborhood uh, today. And uh, you know what was once uh, uh, wooden uh, three and four story buildings is now a whole new, complete neighborhood. And so the issues were, you know, the port was dying, industry was moving, what was the future of San Francisco? And um, this, the leaders of the city, the, the uh, owners of the major businesses and so on, said, well, one of the things we need is a convention center. And City Hall agreed, but didn't know how to get there. So this is really um, w when SPUR was r really formed as SPUR, which was 1959, 
this project began. And as we see now, we go to the bottom line, 2018, we are in the uh, final site, the final building is uh, being uh, developed, you know, 50 years later from the idea to completion. And that's a very important concept because uh, this longevity and continuity that a, a group of citizens and the individual people may change, but the organization goes on. Here's what the site looked like in 1981. And incidentally, this uh, building we see in the foreground is the very last building to be redeveloped that is uh, under construction now. And there is uh, that building is being preserved as a heritage building and a new 40-story um, building is being uh, attached to it. And by 1987, um, only one new building had been uh, uh, built here, and that is the convention center, and the rest had been torn down and was sitting uh, a, as parking lots. And it took until the Museum of Modern Art, uh, this red brick building by Mario Botta uh, was built here that uh, the whole neighborhood changed, that this one act of will, this act of faith on the part of a, of a, 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 of a private museum, that this could be a new neighborhood that no one else really uh, believed, perhaps except Spur. And this has been so successful, you know, in the last couple of years, uh, this uh, new addition by Snohetta has opened and the museum is now, um, uh, I mean, it tripled the size of the museum and the museum is now for a short time bigger than the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, so this site is uh, 35 hectares and you can just see the number of uh, new buildings and uses and projects uh, that happened here, in, including the Spur Urban Center that we built our own uh, headquarters in this neighborhood. So what did this group of citizens do? We recognized, or I should say my, uh, my forerunners in this uh, organization, recognized that the city and um, the, the uh, uh, political leadership and the uh, business leadership had a desire to do something to retool the city, but they didn't know how to do it. So spur volunteer architects, volunteer planners, volunteer um, attorneys, uh, developers all got together, got the area designated as a redevelopment agency and we became the official citizen participation group uh, for the government program. And so what Spur, one of its roles is to be an honest broker, to, to make things happen, to listen to all sides. Um, we insisted that the best architects be hired, uh, that a design review committee be set up. We staff that. We, helped sell bond issues, which are uh, loans for the government to build the major improvements, uh, new transit lines, new subway in the neighborhood. We held hundreds, if not thousands, over the 50 years of public sessions just like this, um, imparting information and getting feedback. We build our own building there, and today we're taking the next step, and that is we are setting up a nonprofit conservancy to manage uh, this land and these buildings in perpetuity. So it will always um, uh, be a first class facility. So this is incredible consistency over uh, a 50 year period and being there day in and day out. And one of the lessons as uh, uh, you as architects and urban designers always is to do your very best work because it's not worth doing if you're not doing your very best work because someone else will do their very best work and you will be left in their dust. And part of doing your very best work is consistency, is being there every day 
picking up the phone every time someone calls and, um, and continuing to work on this because if you don't, someone else will be uh, working on it and probably doing the wrong thing. So there is um, Yerba's Buena Center uh, today, a convention center that attracts a million people a year and a lot of money into the city's revenues, theaters, multiple art galleries, multiple theaters, community events. This is a true, real neighborhood. This is not a civic event or a government event or a business event going on, but this is a neighborhood uh, event uh, run by the Neighborhood Association. Uh, there's housing there, uh, housing uh, uh, for uh, market rate housing, social housing, elderly housing, uh, family housing, which means you need children's playgrounds, uh, senior housing, allotment gardens, and you know, so what does this tell us as urban designers, as planners, and so on? Uh, consistency, you got to be there every day. Citizen leadership, this couldn't happen just by government. It couldn't happen without government, but it, it needs uh, citizens working on this. Social equity, everyone has to be included. And this is, this is an issue, you know, that we live in a society with vast economic differences, but for long-term uh, success, everybody needs to be uh, uh, part of it. It needs to be a complete neighborhood. It's not just a convention center. It's not just a museum. It's not just housing. It's not just a park, but it's all of these things together. And we as citizens need to be nimble. We need to be able to change and, uh, as uh, circumstances change. Some days you open the morning paper and everything is different than it was yesterday. And you need to be able to deal with that. Uh, a skill I think architects tend to be trained very well uh, to do. You need catalysts, you need things to happen. When the Museum of Modern Art d decided to move here, there were people on the board of directors of that organization who said um, they had never been in this neighborhood. The newspaper said no one will ever go there in this neighborhood without understanding that the very decision uh, of the museum to move there changed the whole future of that neighborhood. And lastly, nobody gets everything they want. There were a million compromises on this, and I have sat and continue to sit through many, many difficult meetings as you work things out. But I think one of the lessons is um, uh, that I think most people are good, and most people want the right thing to happen for the city, and it's figuring out how we can work together, figuring out the things that we do agree on and um, not concentrating on the things that we don't. The second uh, case study uh, is a place called Mission Bay, and this was an example where there was a major employer uh, ready to move out of town and we had to find a location to locate them. Um, this was Mission Bay in 1980, and uh, an abandoned uh, rail yard, and these are all uh, empty <laughs> warehouses, and a mere two kilometers from the heart of San Francisco in the financial downtown. This is what the aerial photograph looked like just in 2001, and again, uh, empty warehouses, dirt, you know? And here's what it looks like. This is actually now probably a year and a half ago, and almost every piece of dirt on that is now uh, the site of a new building. And the issue was that San Francisco's second largest employer, uh, a major medical school, research facility, and hospital, uh, needed to expand, and there was no land around it that it could expand. Neighbors opposed its expansion. Uh, land costs were too high for uh, uh, 
a, a hospital and a university to buy. Um, there was no housing for the students that they could afford. And lastly, all these research uh, uh, physicians and uh, doctors were were uh, discovering new drugs, and the, and they and the university wanted somehow uh, to speed up the process of commercializing this and and getting some return uh, to the hospital. So as we looked around the city, we saw that the rail yards uh, had closed, and that this 122 hectares was really just sitting there. The biotech companies were kind of circling like vultures in the air, wanting to partner with the university. The university wanted to partner with them, but they never could quite figure out uh, how to get together. Uh, biotech was happening around the world, but there were zero biotech companies in San Francisco at the time, and this a mere 50 kilometers from uh, Silicon Valley, that, that place that is changing uh, the world. So in 1980, the railroad company that owned this yard uh, proposed uh, development there. And we see from 1980 to 1997, there was plan after plan, but nobody could figure out uh, how to make this work. And we got wind that UC, in fact, had picked a new site outside of San Francisco and we're, we're two days away from announcing that. And with some fancy footwork, the mayor told the landowner, the former railroad company, that they were gonna donate 16 acres, 16 hectares uh, of land to the university. Um, after the um, landowner picked himself up the floor, he realized that this was the only way this development could happen. Uh, we had a series of design competitions. Uh, Machado and Silvetti, who you may know, won the campus design competition. Um, and I've said you have to be flexible and, and things don't always work the way they should. The first university building started construction before the overall design competition and master plan was done. Not the way you want to do it, that's the way it happened. But you know, from decision to the first building opening, six years, an astoundingly fast time. Here is the master plan by uh, Johnson Fain, Los Angeles architects and planners. The blue area is the university. The pink area is the private research companies circling the university, making the relationships with those professors. The yellow area is um, uh, housing um, of a variety of both social housing and market rate housing. We would have preferred more mixture of uses here. The um, university having had bad experience with their neighbors at their former campus, um, wanted to keep uh, the neighbors away from the research. Um, Again, one of those compromises that gets made. Here is the uh, Johnson Fain plan rendered. And today, this development is probably 75% complete. So, in less than 20 years, you know, 30 blocks of development, um, a new light rail line, uh, tremendous number of buildings that have been built um, and uh, again a complete neighborhood including you know fire station library police station public parks and you know here's the way it looked this is now uh, about a, a year and a half ago and as and most of the, most of these sites are either filled with buildings or under construction now Okay. What? You know, it, 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 at any one time, you know, there have been up to 20 construction cranes here, and uh, today uh, that uh, remains uh, unabated. And this is what 
the uh, neighborhood is turning out to look like. And, you know, 12 university research buildings, a 550 bed hospital, a nonprofit health center, 50 biotech pharmaceutical companies, 10 venture capitals, three research institutes, uh, and all of the public space uh, managed by a, a, a private public uh, partnership. And just a, another view, uh, this is the Ricardo uh, Legareta uh, uh, Student Center. And just in terms of demographics, so now there are almost 10,000 people living uh, there. 75% of them are folks who look just like you. They're single. 48% have uh, advanced degrees, very high uh, annual uh, income, probably almost twice the average income of, uh, of San Francisco, uh, including the fact that there is a lot of social housing here. And ultimately, there will be 30,000 jobs in this area. The red brick buildings are social housing. The gray ones are uh, expensive market rate housing right next to each other, uh, equal quality architecturally, and, um, and in fact, some of the uh, social housing, in fact, is, is, are better buildings than the uh, market rate ones. So what did this um, scrappy little group of, of citizens do? First of all, we focused attention on this, that here was a problem. The second largest employer in the city was going to leave, and that would not be good because for all kinds of uh, reasons. Um, and so after, this, after the university uh, got this land for free and announced they were uh, going to go there, again, nobody believed it. Nobody said they would uh, ever, ever go here. We actually hired an individual, a salesman, if you will, to go around to uh, uh, major uh, people in the city, the major families, the major companies, philanthropists, and sell them this idea that this was going to be uh, a new campus. And even more so, the professors, they all said, we're not going to go down there to this poor neighborhood, this neighborhood, nothing's there. We like our campus where we are. So the university and I uh, developed a three-point uh, program. We said, first of all, this has to happen really fast uh, because the professors won't go there if there's one building there sitting in the middle of a bunch of weeds. We said, at any one time, there has to be a building under construction all the time. And as one uh, opens, another one has to be under construction that it had to be a very high amenity level, that all the architects had to be top flight architects. And we also knew that, the old that this new campus was not going to be big enough for a growing university. Any institution that is alive has to grow. You see that on this campus as, and the campuses around here as new buildings are under construction. Uh, an institution has to be a living, breathing organism, which means it has to grow. So as the professors left the old campus, um, those buildings are being rebuilt and repurposed uh, uh, and bringing more vitality there. All the buildings have been done by design competition, which is not usual in the states. Um, we opened a planning information center that was like the architect's office, the urban designer's office, that uh, there was a room probably three or four times the size of this room with all of the drawings, all of the sketches, all of the ideas, all of the explanations of, of what the plan meant and how it meant. Every time an architect proposed a building, he had to build a model of it and fit it into a model of the whole campus so neighbors could understand and, and uh, wouldn't oppose. Um, we then started a wholly new uh, organization uh, called the Campus Facilities Improvement Association that uh, is, a, is a unique way of financing university buildings, um, and it is uh, 
consists entirely of, of former SPUR board members, so we're continuing on our work, and it will go uh, on many decades uh, into the future because we have uh, a paper ownership of some of these buildings. Uh, light rail, there's now uh, uh, light rail uh, serving the campus. Uh, we're working on a commuter line to Silicon Valley. Um, and we continue to hold uh, uh, public educational events on it. What are some of the things SPUR does? We hold forums uh, just like this. We have a website, we have a blog, we have tours, and you have to keep doing this again and again and again because in a city, new people move in, old people move out, uh, people new people uh, find out about things and they say, you're rushing this through, I've never heard of it. So it, the public education needs to uh, continue to go on. Um, you know, everything is not perfect and in none of these projects is everything perfect. We knew the building height was not enough because w we knew it was not gonna um, uh, do everything it needed to do for the university, but that's what the neighbors um, uh, w would allow. Um, there's too much parking. The, a lot of the, all of the uh, uh, private research companies came from Silicon Valley, which is really suburban and auto-oriented, and uh, they demanded more parking than there should have been. Um, my hope is as the land gets more developed, more uh, valuable, it will be too valuable to waste on parking, and those parking garages will get uh, 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 taken out and replaced with higher value uses. Um, it's hard to get retail uh, here because the market isn't there yet. You know, residents have to be there, workers have to be there first, so there's still a lot of empty retail and this is a problem all over much of the world is that we have too much land zoned for retail as so many of us um, are buying things on our phone and not in a brick and mortar store. Um, the architectural design has, has tended to be, uh, has a, had too much sameness to it. There are lots of urban design regulations and it, it, it's, it's holding architects uh, a, a little tight. And finally, a, a major decision uh, was made um, to build a, a basketball arena here. This was not the purpose of the development. The purpose of the development was these research buildings, but it was one of those political uh, uh, decisions that we would have rather not happened. But here, this is a good view of how close all of this is to uh, downtown, and uh, there is the arena. It really is uh, happening. So this took a tremendous leap of faith of imagination because you know, we're now two kilometers from downtown. Yerba Buena was two blocks from downtown. This is two kilometers. And so it was very risky on the part of the, both the developer and uh, the university. Uh, because we wanted this to get going fast, we, did, we figured out, um, uh, and not me, but the smart lawyers on our board, uh, new ways to help fund these buildings. Uh, key to all of this was the schedule. The university said, uh, if, if, if this doesn't get happened in a certain amount of times, we're, we're out of here, we need this. And a schedule is a compelling thing. You all have schedules in your studios here, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's due uh, Tuesday afternoon at five, you better have it done by then. Government often doesn't work that way. Uh, government uh, uh, doesn't usually have schedules and enforcing a schedule was, was very important. Um, it's a, you know, again, it's a public-private partnership that all of the open spaces are, are being uh, in part maintained by the private landowners, by the university. And many times we've had to, I don't know, do you say, uh, turn on a rupee, you know, to, I mean, there's a plan and you, you wake up the next morning and you gotta do a new plan, something, something changed and you need to be uh, flexible. Um, today, 
as San Francisco is going, growing rapidly and as the uh, um, whole region is growing rapidly, we're becoming more of a regional organization and need to tie the organization together with public uh, transit. Um, uh, the United States has done a terrible job, and California in particular, a terrible job on providing transit. Uh, people love their single passenger automobiles, and we're at a point in the world where that can simply no longer continue. Um, the, the Bay Bridge was built in 1939, and rail came into the city. Uh, by the 1950s, the rail was taken off the bridge, and this became buses and uh, automobiles. And you can see, you know, uh, these old industrial uh, uh, buildings in this uh, neighborhood. And when the 1989 earthquake happened, uh, fortunately, the old bus terminal and those elevated freeway ramps were damaged. And for years, Spur had been saying, you know, the rail to Silicon Valley needs to be extended to downtown. There was a proposal for high-speed rail serving the state of California, but no decision on where it should terminate in San Francisco. So here is what that area looked like in 2006, so just, you know, 13 years ago, and here's what it uh, looks like now, and virtually every one of these sites that is still here uh, is under construction. And uh, again, you know, you can tell the, the glass buildings are, are the uh, newest. Um, this is uh, a 325 meter uh, office building, the uh, tallest building in San Francisco, and marking a new center. This uh, building by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill from 1965 was the old center of the financial district, and uh, uh, here is the new one, and the rail terminal is at its base. And today, you know, 30 buildings, some old buildings repurposed, some uh, new uh, uh, buildings, and again, the housing is 40% social housing, 60% market housing, 90,000 employees, a new um, uh, a rooftop park. The transit center still only has buses. The tubes are under it. We're waiting for the train. Um, and incidentally, um, you know, whether I am a dead or alive when the train comes, I'm working on it every day because I'm benefiting from things that people worked on that they never saw happen. But we need to be always thinking uh, 50 and 100 years into the future. Uh, you know, all new sidewalks, streets, landscaping, and so on, and again, uh, public, private, uh, uh, management. New buildings still under construction, uh, new buildings still to come, new rail connections still to come. Uh, here's what it um, looks like. There is the 300-meter uh, building. Here is a park on the roof of this station. The buses come in to the upper level. The trains will come in uh, to the lower level. These are actual uh, photographs of, uh, of the park just before it opened. It opened, I think, last August. And um, one of the things Spur insisted upon was there needed to be a connection between, a, a visual connection between the park on the roof, bringing light down into the terminal and indeed down into where the trains would come in and indeed that is what has been built. This is, this is glass down here uh, between the concourse floor and the lower floors. And so here's kind of three stages of, of development. Um, here is 1910. Uh, here is 1980s, maybe 1990. And here's uh, what we're building uh, today. So 
what did we do? Spur led the led the band for uh, bringing rail downtown. Uh, we we induced the city to to upzone uh, the land around here, and this was 25 years ago to pick this as the highest uh, height in the city to be the new sit, uh, uh, center. We said there had to be a multimodal terminal. We have to bring the rail down here, and um, and again, uh, this was done through a design competition, and then again, public-private maintenance of the open space. So this is a true regional project. Um, it's kind of one step at a time. There. The hundred-year plan isn't really out there in terms of when the transit will come, but it will come. Um, we organized the developers to spend more money than they wanted to spend, or, but they understood it would increase their profits in the, in the long term. And again, public-private uh, maintenance of the open spaces. So. Um, with that, I'm open for questions, conversations, discussions. Have at me. So I suppose the opportunity is to be challenged by that and to challenge him. And a number of things uh, may strike you, but what I'm so interested in is the perspective he has in terms of time. So where you imagine yourselves coming here for a year or two years and whatever may or may not be happening after that is yet to be considered, the perspective that this organization has is for generations. And so what we see as a city around us is something very immediate, it's something that we want to have now. Their organization has a vision for something that is going from your generation to the next generation. So maybe any thoughts relating to, to time? Any thoughts in relating to how people organize themselves? Uh, the particular emphasis that seems to be on engaging community beyond uh, the civic administration, beyond the design and construction professionals. It seems that community engagement is one of the key elements here. Would anyone like to connect on some of these issues? Would any of this relate to any projects that anyone, that anyone is working on at the moment? Issues arising? Oh yeah, they will, they will. They will yeah. voluntary nature of SPUR and how that worked? I mean, how, what kind of incentives did people have to give their time to, you know, help SPUR and help all these efforts? Let, let me start with the second question because it, it relates um, uh, to the first. As architects and urban designers, uh, you are, uh, you have to get work, right? And to get work, there have to be the right conditions. The community has to generally want things. The city government, or whatever the governing body is, uh, has to want things. You have to develop, uh, there has to be a client who is willing uh, to pay for things. And so it is in architects' selfish self-interest to belong to community organizations that make the conditions possible for them to get work. I mean, there, you've just seen hundreds of millions of billions of rupees worth of architectural commissions, you know, in, in these buildings. And um, that might not well have happened, and it certainly 
wouldn't have happened to the extent and quality it did w without uh, people working on this. It's also a way as a young professional to fill out your portfolio. You know, when you go to your first job, you're going to have some wonderful student uh, projects to show, but you know, wh what about five years later, you know, and you're um, a young gal or guy in an architect's office uh, detailing bathroom partitions, you know, that that's not what you want to sell yourself on, uh, but you can, if you can show a project that here, I was on this for a committee and we did this urban design and, um, and I'm an expert on this. And in fact, that has really happened. Um, you know, as a port city, one of the projects we worked on for many years uh, was the waterfront. And the person who, um, the architect, as a, as a young architect who chaired this committee at SPUR, uh, made his whole career off of that work. He is the recognized expert on waterfront development in San Francisco. He's also the recognized person if you want to get a project through city government because while he was working hand in hand with the city bureaucrats, he built the relationships and uh, built a mutual trust and uh, understanding. So, you know, um, and when it comes to communities, uh, there's, there can be a lot of rancor and disagreement, but my attitude is that almost everybody really wants the same thing. They want their community to be better, and this person thinks it'll be better if we do this, that person says, no, it'll be better if we do that. But in, in fact, if you start out with the attitude that, um, not that this person is a jerk, but they have a different idea of how to get to the same goal, that really helps. And then, don't talk about theories, but talk about specifics. Make a list on the whiteboard of everything this person, let, let them make their list, let the other person make their list. Try to go back to not the answers, because they're gonna tell you the answer of how to do it. What you wanna do is you wanna find out what their goals are, what their principles are, and see how much you can get them together. And then go back to your office and draw up what the principles result in. And you'll be surprised, and everyone will be surprised, because what you think abstractly and how that really will turn out may be quite different. And, um, and, and that often helps. It doesn't always help, but it often helps. Uh, can I just, in relation to realities, uh, who's involved with or has any engagement with the new metro? Has anyone got anything to do with the new metro? Any project coming up around that? Any, any design engagement with the new metro? Does anyone know about the new metro? <laughs> yes, 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 good, good. So what is the new metro? The, the new metro is transforming the city. And I think, so just in relation to <clears throat> the impact of, of, of design decisions being made on whole sections of the city, is anyone interested in the process of how that uh, metro came to be where it is? Has anyone thought about the impact that this facility will have on communities, on um, future development, residential, commercial, whatever, whatever? I mean, there's an incredible, um, just in terms of the kind of changes Jim talks about, we're seeing it here in Ahmedabad, it's not just plot by plot. This is a radical uh, intervention in the city. Um, and so with respect to architecture or planning, uh, would that excite anyone to see, well, gosh, okay, so how does this happen? So I think what Jim is talking about is processes where people get involved. Now, it clearly, um, well, you don't have, maybe you've got other projects, clearly you've got other projects to do, but clearly none of you are involved in the metro, and, the, and yet it's chugging down the road um, at a rate of knots. 
or what about all the other communities it's affecting? Is anyone involved? Or does it simply just happen, like something that lands out of the sky? Is it a good thing? Is the metro a wonderful thing? Is it a, is it a bad thing? Has anyone an opinion on the metro? Just to, you've seen it now, come on. Any, any engagement? As architects, mm. you know, uh, we have this wonderful tool today called Google Earth. Go on Google Earth and look at Toronto, Toronto, Canada. You can see where every metro station is by the land use pattern that has evolved around this subway station that started in the 60s. Go in any Chinese city. You're out in a cornfield in China and all of a sudden there's this, uh, uh, 10 60-story buildings in the middle of the cornfield. You know there's a subway station <laughs> there. And um, uh, because, you know, this kind of uh, transportation network uh, determines, the, in many ways, the, the future of our cities. And whether it goes into a wealthy neighborhood or a poor neighborhood, whether there is development opportunity around the station or not, all of these things are, are transformative. And there are things that are very helpful for you to get involved in because you have this specialized knowledge. And you can imagine, you know, most people have not much imagination. They see the city around them and they think it'll be this way forever. Your whole way of thinking is imagining a future of seeing a piece of dirt and imagining what this will be someday. And so as people propose transportation systems, other water, sewer, infrastructure, electrical systems, imagine what this is going to be, how it's going to change uh, the city. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? How can you make it even better? Okay, so, uh, so if you all haven't been engaged with the metro, has anyone been involved with the riverfront? Yes, um, Sarah has, so <laughs> Sarah's very involved. Any student, has anyone had any, any, uh, any involved in any way with the riverfront? Has anyone been to the riverfront? Yes, 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 okay. Have you run on the riverfront? Have you cycled on it? Have you done anything on the riverfront? Yes, okay, good, good. So, I mean, what can the riverfront become? So, there's a whole discussion about the fact that it's there. Now it's there. So, as designers, what are we going to do to make that a better place? Any ideas? And is that something that, so again, in terms of process, so radical transformation. So, city as it is, developing piecemeal, and then huge, significant changes that are the potential catalyst for, if we're to do our job right, wonderful transformations. If we're going to sit here and do nothing, well, it'll be the job of opportunists to take this, uh, to make it benefit themselves and not us as, a, as, a, as possible stakeholders in the city. So anyway, I suppose trying to connect for you back into our reality. So Sarah might want to say something about uh, the river, but I'm hoping that some students will too, so please, yeah. I don't want to say anything. Okay. No, I mean, it's a huge project. Everyone knows about it, what it did to communities and hmm. the sort of uh, negative impacts, which we've captured in a couple of short films that are there on the hmm. Benjamin Waters Museum website, but it is also a space for the urban middle classes, and so the issues of equity and who lives where and who has access to water and basically what the summer Hmm. because it's been contained by the hmm. embankments and it has massive effects both downstream communities hmm. which were not thought of earlier. Hmm. So there's a lot of stuff sure. there around sure. water, around hmm. place, around hmm. identity. Hmm. But wonderful design opportunities. Yeah. So, I mean, you're expressing further, so I'm just, uh, it, the challenge is there. So, except that we now rise to those challenges yeah. as designers, um, that's what we're here for. So. I suppose, um, well, I mean, the, the chance to talk uh, can be among yourselves. Um, obviously, Mr. Chapel has engaged in this way for many, many years and clearly is also committed to working uh, at projects that 
the next generation, the generation after, may see the result of. So that's another wonderful continuity to see yourself as part of a much bigger process. Um, so perhaps, uh, oh good, yeah, please. One of the first steps that were taken was the introduction of the uh, San Francisco MoMA, right? And um, like that was the first step. So um, I, I want to understand what is what was like the economic status of the people living <coughs> within that area, so that uh, bec because something like an art center, I mean, um, <laughs> there's this saying, I mean, uh, desperate people make ideal workers and distracted citizens. So. What was the economic status of the people living there that an art center uh, facilitated uh, you know, further development in the area? You, you have hit on a serious problem and a serious mistake that we made or my, my predecessors made. And that is these were elderly, impoverished people. And at that time, the government had no policy to relocate those people you know, the buildings were torn down, they were thrown out. And um, one of the reasons the project took 50 years is because um, uh, people who were more socially conscious got involved in this and sued the city and held up the development for many years until a lot of, uh, a lot of the housing that was built there is, is senior housing. But the fact is a lot of people were harmed by that. The effect still goes on in San Francisco where we have a very large homeless problem. And part of the reasons we have a homeless problem is that the single room occupancy hotels that used to be there were torn down and because they were seen as slums. Today we understand that single room occupancy hotels are a very necessary part of a city, that there are a lot of people in that income category, that this is an appropriate uh, uh, kind of housing. So uh, I have to say, in the 1960s, um, there, <coughs> it's, um, it's discouraging because the one time that planners had power in America, we misused the power because we did not understand what a city is and what the DNA of a city is, this small, fine grain uh, uh, detail, uh, you know, the things you see in the old city today. All as the planners saw was poverty, disease, fire hazard, all of those kinds of things. And, you know, today, that would never be done. There would be a small scale, detailed, building by building intervention to upgrade uh, the neighborhood and when, where things were torn down, uh, there would be housing in place for those uh, neighbors uh, immediately. And um, uh, so a, a, a lesson learned. Yes. Can you re rephrase that in one question for me? Uh, so the one question is uh, authentication of the information, and it is divided into three parts, like past resources, present methodologies, and a group of people with whom we will discuss the future possibilities. 
I guess, you know, tr truth is r relative and it depends on the people uh, who are there. So I think the, the answer to it is to get the right people in the room. And the people in the room are not just us as professionals, but they're the people who live there, the people who have lived there for a long time. There are people who we, uh, the people we often forget are the people who are going to live there or that we are, imagine are uh, going to live there. And um, uh, other, otherwise, uh, we get a lot of wrong information. You know, it, and it, it can't just come out of books. So, so what does this tell us? I guess it tells us that it's not enough to do the project that has been done and to protect those people who are now being protected by the flood wall, but an integral part of that project needed to be or needs to be dealing with the people who no longer live there, you know, and that there needs to be housing and community built for them, whether it's here, whether it's 20 kilometers away, that's to be negotiated. But, you know, every, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, and we need to l look at that and right, right from the start. You know, and if, if you are expecting people to move, you have to make a place for them to move where they want to move. It has to be clearly, they have to understand it's going to be better because some things won't be better. The community, neighborhoods, relationships, comfort of knowing where you live, there will be dislocations, but as, as planners, one of the things we, we have to try and do is minimize those dis, mental dislocations while the physical dislocations go on. It's a difficult task. I'm going to, perhaps, given that we've had a little exchange, I'm going to, on your behalf and on behalf of the library who are sponsoring these lectures. Thank uh, Mr. Chappell very much for coming and for sharing his knowledge. Uh, the information is there as, as presented. And uh, thank you for being here also. Take it with you, absorb it, use it. Uh, it's an opportunity. So thanks very much again and look forward to seeing you at the next lecture.